course, they're, 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 they're getting involved in another war. Uh, extraordinary fixation, which British politicians seem to have, mm. that we're still a great power when we're not. Well, I don't think the outcome of that is necessarily going to be good electorally either. Well, I know I should be kind to the Conservatives. I, the, the thing which has always amazed me is that the Conservatives have been, how should I put it, spitting from a great height on their own voters for about uh, 20 years now, and particularly since the, uh, since the leadership of David Cameron. And loyally trooped to uh, to vote for them and to confirm the takeover of their party by Blairites. Now, uh, when they actually face the possibility of another Blairite government uh, led by Keir Starmer, they're now proposing to allow Keir Starmer to become prime minister. Uh, it's they they zig when they should have zagged, and they zag when they should have zigged. But I can't. It, it, none of this is rational, but it does seem to me to be very likely to happen. Not because huge numbers of people will vote Labour. Mm but because large numbers of Tories will vote for rivals on the right and or, or simply not vote Tory at all, or just do nothing, and so there will be a Labour government. Now, I, on the other hand, I, I, I listened with interest to Chris Mullin, because I, too, earlier on in this programme, and I, I, too, was involved in the 1992 election and was uh, astonished by the results of that, and I'm old enough to remember the 1964 election, which Alec Douglas Hume very nearly won uh, after everybody had assumed that Labour would romp in in October 1964 with a huge majority. So it is impossible to predict these things. Mm. Uh, they can go very wrong for oppositions and they can suddenly go right for governments if people get nervous of change. But it doesn't look very good for them, I have to say. Uh, Jane Mulcairins, this idea that Grant Shapps was saying that, you know, we have a plan, um, Labour don't have a plan, and also do we really want to go back to square one? Do you think that's going to land with people? Um. It's interesting that Grant Sharp says he has a plan. I mean, they might have a plan, but it does seem to change every week. Um, if they've got a plan, I mean, maybe they're going to tell people what it is. Um, they've, got, they've got a five-point plan. Well, yeah, it's going really well, that five-point plan, isn't it? Doing so well on all of it. Um, I, I do think this poll is interesting because, obviously, it's not great timing for Rishi Sunak going into this week, you know, with the Rwanda bill and possible rebellions. I also do think it's important to note that this poll was commissioned by a group of Tory donors who want him to be tougher on immigration. Um, so, you know, a little bit of self-interest in the commissioning of this poll, I think, particularly now. But, but you know, I, I completely agree with Peter in the sense of, um, you know, if this is a 1997-style wipeout, it's not particularly because the country wants Keir Starmer necessarily. You know, he's, he said a Blairite government. I mean, the big difference with Keir Starmer and Tony Blair is that, you know, Blair isn't, uh, Keir Starmer isn't carrying this kind of enormous hope and, and promise. Um, it's basically just a vote against this lot um, in whichever way that comes, whether it's to the right or, you know, in tactical voting or lots to the Lib Dems potentially, you know, in seats that were won in 2019. Um, yeah, I mean, no one's ever turned around a 20 point, deficit in this amount of time um so yeah i mean they better come up with a good plan um uh, peter are we being unfair here though actually because they do have a five-point plan and some of it i mean inflation for example that 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 was brought to to where uh where they said they wanted it to get to maybe the successful parts of their plan are being obscured by as always happens, by the messy part of others. I mean, the Rwanda bill, for example, the arguments over that, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe maybe, actually we do need to give the Conservatives some credit for some of the kind of bullet points that, that, that Rishi Sunak has been talking about. Well, you can if you like. It's sort of my job to be unfair to them, not that they don't <laughs> deserve it. Uh, the inflation that, that we're, we're told is now being brought down was caused by, by Rishi Sunak when he was in the cabinet, uh, spending billions of non-existent pounds on the COVID pack and the huge mistake which the government made over that. So to, to now say, oh, well, we're getting it down. Well, of course, they're get, getting it down because inflation works its way through. The, the, the value of money falls and that eventually becomes permanent and everything changes to suit it. And the inflation figures go down, but people have still lost a huge amount in savings and the value of their incomes. And an awful lot of things are more expensive now by a mile than they were before. That that doesn't work through uh, or cease to happen. So it doesn't really mean very much. It's clear from the the legal immigration figures of, the, of, of actually the past 
13 years that the Tories are in favour of large-scale immigration, so their claims to be controlling the boats coming across the, the channel, are, even if they're true and not very, very impressive, they haven't really got very much to say that to, to someone who's seriously conservative, as I claim to be myself, mm. uh, the, the only difference between Labour and the Conservatives is that the Conservatives don't understand that they're pursuing a Blairite uh, set of policies, and the Blairites do, and therefore, presumably, the Blairites are slightly more dangerous because they're more likely to actually achieve their ends, which I dislike. Mm. But that's all that's in it for me. But no, you can't really come up with any defence. And now, of course, they're, 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 they're getting involved in another war. Uh, a strong, extraordinary fixation which British politicians seem to have mm. that we're still a great power when we're not. Well, I don't think the outcome of that is necessarily going to be good electorally either. Thought, uh, Britain used to say, or still says, it has a role in maintaining that sense of world order. The latest attempt uh, for it to be broken, in some people's views, is what's going on in the Red Sea. The Houthis attacking shipping and then the Americans and the British attacking the Houthis in Yemen. Is that a legitimate attempt to hold on to our interests or is that dragging us closer to a conflict we need to be running in the other direction to? Well, I think it's self-delusion. We simply aren't a major power anymore. The, our, our, I, I read somewhere the other day that, that our uh, involvement in the attack on the, on the Houthis was the, the tip of the American spearhead. It's absolutely the, the opposite. We're the fifth wheel in the American cart. The British planes which flew uh, to Yemen on that mission, as far as I can discover, were guided to their targets by the, 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 the systems aboard the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower and couldn't have done what they did without being involved in, in American planning and, and, uh, and American direction. So the idea that we operated independently is absurd. We, we simply went along because the Americans don't like being on their own in these matters. And they wanted somebody to be there with them. And we agreed. The, the French, interestingly, did not. Uh, and a number of other countries said, well, we support it, but they didn't take part. I'm not quite sure why this country, which has been running down its defences with increasing vigour since the Margaret Thatcher era, imagines that it is still a major power or wants uh, to suck up so much to the United States, which doesn't treat us when, it, when push comes to shove with any particular consideration in return. Yeah. I really do think that if, if, the, if, a, if a political force emerged in this country and said, it's time we recognise that we're, 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 we're wealthy on our own terms, a stable country with many, many advantages. We're not a world power anymore. Uh, we, we should be much more involved in fixing our own problems from our terrible schools to our pothole roads than to trying to crusade around the world in wars which we can't ourselves influence. It would be quite successful. But you, you don't get anybody in British politics who says this. And as soon as anyone becomes prime minister, it seems to me they're automatically begin to look for for somewhere to bomb and lo they bomb it and, and then we have to spend years and, and then they send troops there as often as not we have to spend years and years getting them out again with considerable casualties in between the afghanistan episode particularly yeah. rest in the iraq one yeah. why is it that there isn't there isn't more sense talked about these involvements why do we still act as if as if it was the edwardian era and even then i think the idea of masterly inactivity was quite popular among some people. I'm yeah. very much in favour of masterly inactivity. In I, think master, policy. It's I think that's the, the best the, result. Yeah, there's something to be said for that. Jane, what do you make of that idea? I, I often think about when you think about Scandinavia, there was a period when Scandinavia was a great world leading force in, in the 11th centuries, the 9th and 10th centuries. They charged around the place conquering all, all and sundry. Um, but it doesn't seem to cling to that now. And, and Scandinavia then becomes a series of small countries which don't seek to influence the rest of the world very much. Is what Peter was saying, and, and maybe that, would you be happy with a political party that said, you know what, the empire's over, you're not a yeah. big force anymore, uh, cultivate your own garden and, and leave other people to do whatever they want to do? Yeah, I do think it's interesting, and I think there is a legacy of empire which we don't seem to be willing to shake off. And I would direct you to Satnam Sanghera's excellent piece in the Times magazine on Saturday um, about his new book and the legacy of, of empire, because, yeah, I think we, we haven't really shaken it off in this country in the way that some others have. But I think that there's also a different angle here, which I think is potentially what it does for leaders at home, you, you know, to... Um, 
to sort of show a little bit of pomp abroad. I mean, yeah. a cynic might flag up the timing of Rishi Sunak's surprise visit to Ukraine on Friday, you know, at the beginning of election year, before a tricky week regarding immigration. You know, we can maybe think of someone else who used to pop on a flat jacket and go to Kiev when things got hard at home. Um, and I also think, you know, the implications of not intervening in the Red Sea are not just about international diplomacy. I mean, they're about economics. You know, the front page of the Observer yesterday said, you know, what's happening there could shatter economic recovery hopes. And we know that this government, you know, is trying to persuade voters that they're sorting the economy out in plenty of time before the election. And they don't want that dashed as well as many of their other points on their five point plan. Um, so, you know, I think there are many reasons why this country, you know, at the moment is choosing to intervene abroad. When it comes to Israel and Gaza, I mean, that, I think that's a, that's a more difficult one. I, I don't mean to sound defeatist, but, I, you know, I do feel like anything anyone does at the moment, I don't know how much of a difference it's going to make. You know, if I Israel's think... not going to listen to America, I, you know, I don't know that it's going to listen to us. But but I do think we do still have a role in the world. I mean, disproportionate to our size and power, for sure. But, you know, for some reason, we do. And I think when it comes to things like America's evacuation from Afghanistan, you know, it was shameful and we should have done, we should have been able to do more, I think, you know, to, to support. But I suppose there's Peter's point about the extent to which we're, we're, to, we're just proxy ruled by America yeah. in, in these areas is, is an interesting one.